All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to San Francisco Java User Group in the Microsoft Reactor space. Um, excited to be with you tonight. We are uh, going to get started here in just a moment. Um, we're streaming. We had to switch to uh, a, a YouTube stream. Um, so uh, I'm going to make sure that that's uh, if you if you don't have the URL, just grab that off the meetup.com. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully you're already seeing this. So uh, tonight we have uh, Sergey from Test Containers. We're going to be uh, having a fun session tonight talking about that. Um, and uh, next month uh, we're going to have uh, Chris Richardson talking about uh, microservice architecture. Uh, one of uh, personal, uh, an old colleague and uh, a great presenter is yeah. So we're looking forward to that. Um, please feel free to register for that. I'm going to drop the link here into the. Uh, zoom into the uh, YouTube chat in just a second. Um, so if you want to register for that, uh, did that link work? Did that come through, Albina? Just curious. Hoping, hoping it did. Cool. All right. And uh, so yeah, again, my name's Peter. Um, so uh, you, you uh, would would want hoping that you'll be able to join for next month. And um, this is going to get recorded, and we'll send out the recording to everyone. Um, we'll probably figure out a way to post it on YouTube as well. So uh, if you want to get a notification of the recording, um, you know, please make sure you subscribe to the uh, Java user group channel. Um, and I think we'll, we'll probably be able to send out a link to this, to this one here. Um, so I work for a company called MariaDB. Uh, anyone used MySQL or MariaDB before? Just curious, a couple folks. All right, awesome. Um, if you want, uh, you can sign up for uh, MariaDB Cloud. Uh, they'll give you a couple hundred dollar credit. Um, right here at uh, um, id.mariadb.com, um, and it offers a hosted service uh, for for MariaDB. Um, they're working on some um, global replicated topologies with uh, Expand, which is a um, new aspect uh, of you know you're not just doing like a single server topology; you're doing distributed SQL. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and feel free to log in and give it a test. Uh, and if you want notification on future events, uh, please feel free to follow us on Twitter. Um, I want to give the time. We, we started a little bit late, so I want to try giving some of the time back to, to Sergey here this evening. Um, so thank you for, for joining. And um, yeah, uh, just make sure to, to come back next month for, for Chris. And um, I think we'll probably have a few exciting things from, from Sergey this evening as well about test containers and atomic no pressure, char. no pressure. So thank you. All right, let me stop sharing and I'm gonna uh, hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight and looking forward to, to your talk. Um, all right, welcome and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, Peter. Um, what do you say about Mon uh, my year and all this cloud stuff? Like yeah, now, like, can, can you just do your talk? Like, you know, I want to hear about it. Like, it's just like, do you, do you really want to talk about sure. test containers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I should, I should check that one. Well. It. Awesome. Uh, I think we're good to go. We're ready to start. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming uh, who, who are here in person. Uh, those who are watching on YouTube, also, thanks for watching the thing on YouTube. I hope it's a good use of your time uh, because you have so many options right now. And um, yeah, I'm excited to get started. Um, it's been a while since I did my last talk at the conference. In fact, when pandemic started, I wasn't doing any talks. And then was it in August? Yeah, in August, I went to KCDC. It was my first talk after the pandemic, and I returned with my first COVID uh, since the pandemic started. So hopefully this talk, um, nine months later, won't give me another COVID, uh, but we will see. I don't mind because I'm really excited to be presenting here. So um, let's jump straight into it. Um, so what we're talking about here, we're talking about te test containers, uh, and you probably already figured out that there's something about testing. Um, there are some hints um, here and there, but before we actually talk about it, because before we actively talk about it, just like raise, raise your hand if you love testing, just like, you know, like you cannot live without testing, like testing is cool. All right, okay, so many hands, uh, awesome. Actually, keep your hand up or raise it again if you love testing with mocks. Mocks, anyone? Okay, we have a Stockholm Syndrome person here. Um, I, hope, I hope I will be able to convince you that there are some other options. Uh, um, but on the other hand, maybe that works for you. If it works for you, then you know, why change? Anyways, uh, I love testing. Um, I'm coming from development background. Um, and 
I happen to be CEO and co-founder of Atomic Jar, the company behind Test Containers, a project we're going to talk about here. But you know, the way I prefer to refer, refer to myself, I'm just a developer with privileges um, now that I work as a CEO. And uh, in other things, uh, I somehow became a Java champion. I don't know why someone was just like, yes, I'm, I'm doing great things. Um, and I'm really, really passionate about developer tools. I mean. If you want to I know, wake up, wake me up in the middle of the night after a really, really long day, and if you talk about DevTools, I'll be happy to talk about DevTools in the middle of the night. Any other topic, please don't wake, up, wake me up in the middle of the night. And uh, I was also one of the original uh, test containers, uh, co maintainers, uh, and helped uh, create the project. Um, but I can talk about it in a second. But before we talk about test containers, we kind of have to define why we talk about testing after all especially automated testing. Because you know, if, if it wasn't a problem for organizations, for us developers, for anyone else, then why would we spend time on testing? But apparently, testing is actually a major time sink for organizations. Like A lot of time is spent on testing, especially on wrong testing or on inefficient testing. And it makes testing the biggest bottleneck uh, because we always optim optimize and then once we optimize testing, the next bottleneck will be something else. But right now, testing is indeed one of the big ones. And why it is important to not have bottlenecks? Because we need to deliver, we need to ship often, we need to uh, have confidence why we, what we are doing as developers, right? Um, and at the end of the day, if we have perfect frameworks that allows us to, I don't know, right now we have ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot and all that, you can just like whisper it, hey, one application doing that and that and that, okay, something can generate application for you, which is kind of cool. And there are also some amazing frameworks that come with a lot of batteries included, uh, Wink Wink Spring Boot. Um, but um, TAS isn't really something, and I know I'm going really deep here uh, and I'm distracting uh, the topic, but I don't think the test is something that should be generated. Um, and that's not going to be the main topic of this uh, talk, but just my opinion on uh, AI, because everyone is asking about AI. I'm sure you have this question. Uh, there is a ton of value in the process of creating tests, because that's how you turn your assumptions into something runnable. And then you, as a developer, once you express your assumptions with code, other developers can review it and say, hey, why did you think that this property is string if it's an uh, integer? Or are we really supposed to return that result from this endpoint? So I see testing as one of the best collaboration points for developers in teams. Um, even for individual developers, they can still collaborate with themselves just by writing tests. And then by reading it, it's just like, am I doing the right thing? And is my application working the way I think it should be working? So love testing. Uh, it's the last thing I would... Uh, you know, I would stop doing as a developer. Uh, there are many things I would rather not do as a developer. But testing is really, really the last one. And when we talk about testing, uh, I think there are multiple, um, you know, multiple weaves of uh, testing and how testing been done. And 10 years ago, or nowadays it's closer to 15 years ago, testing was rather like traditional uh, pyramid or reverse pyramid where you have like a ton of unit tests, some integration tests, end-to-end -end test, uh, and that's, by the way, that's great. Like in 2010, the 10, if you had that, it was amazing. It was great, super, because a lot of organizations, they were YOLO to production, their code, uh, and then, well, our users become our uh, testers, which isn't really great, I think. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, back and forth uh, when you need to roll back releases and all that. But with uh, DevOps movement, with uh, new tooling, with uh, a lot of stuff happening, it really changed the testing approach, if you ask me, because, and that here I'm referring to Spotify, who wrote this blog post in 2018 about how they now prefer to do honeycomb testing. And the whole idea is that um, you are no longer relying on unit tests as your main way of testing. You still need unit tests to verify some implementation details, maybe some algorithms, maybe some transformations, but modern applications, they just, read from one database, perform some simple transformation, and return to some other I.O. source, be it REST endpoint or Kafka topic or whatever. So that isn't something that you can easily unit test because there are a lot of external uh, requests, like I.O. requests uh, going back and forth. Uh, and mocking them uh, is not the right way to ensure that your application is working correctly because mocks in reality are reflections of our assumptions. And testing helps us remove the assumptions. 
but to remove the assumptions, we should not be introducing more assumptions such as mocks. And they also decided for them that integration testing is a sweet spot for them. No, it doesn't say that you have 100% confidence in the software you're creating if, you're, if you write a lot of integration tests. You still need unit tests, you still need add to end tests, and you will always be eventually testing in production uh, because there will always be some things that cannot be tested in development, but it doesn't mean that we should not be doing any testing because it doesn't give us 100% confidence. It actually gives us enough confidence to know that the code we are developing is actually good, that it's working, uh, not just application starts, but like, it's working as suspected. And by the way, um, you also see that uh, in 2010s, uh, the norm was that developers were only responsible for unit testing. And they only knew how to do unit testing. They had no idea how do we do integration testing or end-to-end -end testing because that's some other QA teams that start a firmware environment, or maybe not firmware, just a like staging environment, and write Selenium tests that open some web pages, blah, blah, blah. But with the with a revolution uh, that DevOps brought, uh, it also brought us the right tooling to be able to perform tasks uh, by developers. So the role of QA teams has reduced dramatically. There is still value in having QA teams, just the majority of testing is shifting to the lab. And I apologize for marketing term, but I actually, love, uh, I actually like uh, this whole idea of just like moving things to the lab, as in to where it all starts because we, as developers, we create value. And not being able to validate our own value is kind of just like, I want to. Like, I want to know that what I'm doing actually makes sense. I talked quite long, okay, for, I talked for quite long for, uh, about integration testing, but let's maybe take a step back and define what integration testing is. Because there is a lot of um, confusion about is it something where I have like staging environment, like integration environment or whatever, or what is integration testing? So first of all, integration testing, well, this isn't integration testing. When you send an email to your production customers, uh, hello HBO, that's not uh, what I call integration testing. Um, that's testing in production. So they should have used the proper, uh, proper um, email title. That said, good integration testing would help you avoid this situation because you would not be using any infrastructure to perform this test. And uh, speaking of integration testing, um, there, there's a ton of uh, fun GIFs uh, about this. Um, sorry if you're team GIF, uh, I say it GIF. Anyways, um, probably the sync passed unit test, right? Because it works, like you open, you open uh, valve, uh, water is flowing, and the door passed the unit test as well. But when you put door next to the sink, things happen. And of course, someone was very creative to create a workaround for it. But at the same time, um, we want to avoid situations like this. We don't want to cut doors after we install them. We ideally want to know in advance. Um, and the role of integration testing is to put your application into an environment or into um, into situation that is close to production uh, even before you actually deploy it to production. So imagine they had a lab uh, before, when, when, before they installed the door just to check whether it's going to uh, work or not. And I already said the word environment, not my favorite word, by the way, because I think there is a lot of focus on old school way of testing where we have staging environment, where we um, deploy things to some ephemeral environments or whatever, environments, 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 uh, they bring this mindset of starting everything at once. But integration testing, and here I'm referring to Martin Fowler, uh, who is a very, very smart guy talking a lot about testing and other uh, good techniques uh, in software development. Um, and what Martin says is that integration testing usually refers to a broad set of tests so where you start your whole application, basically. But it doesn't have to be. It can be just your service and its direct dependencies. So like my Kafka, my Elasticsearch, my whatever uh, that I need to run my uh, test. And everything else, like every other service in my uh, infrastructure, can actually be um, backed by test doubles. And maybe uh, as a next step in, uh, in, in the maturity model of testing, some contract testing can be added on top. But the key here is that you don't need to start your whole infrastructure 
your whole uh, product just to test one piece of it. And my favorite reference uh, I make is uh, Netflix. When Netflix, I mean, Netflix are using test containers. And um, imagine starting the whole Netflix with, I don't know, I don't know, you know, it was why. Like, and nobody knows how to start Netflix from scratch, right? Um, um, and it's just not possible. It's just too big to start. And it's very appealing when you start uh, developing with Greenfield project. We only have like two microservices to so just start both microservices. But it's a dead end in terms of uh, scalability because soon you will overgrow your, um, your application, your infrastructure, and you will end up with, you know, uh, with a problem because all our testing approach was relying on the fact that we start everything and it becomes slow as well. When I talk about integration testing, I think about uh, seconds to get a green test. I'm not thinking minutes, I'm not thinking hours, days, or whatever, it's seconds. But if you need to start your whole application from scratch with Docker containers and whatever, we are not, no longer talking about seconds. We are talking about minutes or hours, uh, and we are going in a really wrong way. So just to define, in my opinion, integration testing, uh, good integration testing, is not end-to-end -end testing, not smoke testing, but actually a way to test your service with its direct dependencies and just direct dependencies to avoid transitive, transitive dependencies. Because if you're testing movie catalog service, you probably would not want to start also user service, notification service, uh, KYC service, whatever service. Uh, you don't need them to just test your movie catalog service. And that is important. This is why I spent so much time talking about it. But <laughs> anyways, a good way to describe wrong integration testing is integrated tests, where uh, you start other services, um, where you test against other services in your testing environment, especially uh, other online services, uh, or uh, when you change your system and it breaks uh, um, your other parts of, of the system. Can we talk for a second about um, microservices? Why we did microservices? Because we wanted to decouple things. We wanted to have multiple lanes how we deliver to production. But if we start everything, like if we depend on other services to test our service, we bring this bottleneck, we, we shift bottleneck to the left. So like we're shifting something to the left, but not what should be shifted, because now other services become bottleneck for delivery. And if someone breaks notification service, Nobody can deliver to production because their tests are failing because uh, it's a trend that depends on their tests. So to make it clear, let's make sure that we talk about testing individual components, individual units of our um, microservices, or even monoliths or whatever, um, instead of starting the whole thing. So we're talking about integration testing. And um, Integration testing has uh, advantages and disadvantages, uh, or not really disadvantages, just things to remember. So definitely a huge, uh, huge value we're getting with integration testing is the ability to test with real world um, external dependencies. We are we're no longer mocking our Postgres, we are no longer mocking Kafka, we just use real Postgres, real Kafka, real whatever, because we don't want to make any assumptions about how they work. And in fact, I worked with the company and they were mocking Elasticsearch and they ended up basically re-implementing Elasticsearch as a mock. Uh, and a lot of functionality of Elasticsearch, they ended up just like, building their own Elasticsearch for testing that makes no sense at all, especially if you can um, start a real one. And for a very long uh, time, it was actually challenging to start real dependencies because we didn't have the right tooling, but I think now we have. And obviously, since we talk about starting real dependencies, it cannot be as fast as in-memory mocks and whatever, but it should be fast enough for us to not wait for uh, too long to get a result of our test, to get either a green test uh, or failing test that will help us identify what the problem is. So yes, it's not as fast as unit testing, but it can be very, very close to unit testing, and I'll show you how uh, later. And since we talk about starting real things, we should not forget that uh, it inherits um, platform level characteristics, such as it must be cross-platform, uh, it must support your different environments, like it should run on CI, it should run on Windows, it should run on Mac, it should run everywhere. Um, unlike unit testing, where it obviously runs everywhere because uh, 
we have Java and Java runs uh, everywhere. So that is important to keep in mind. And integration testing has, uh, has been going a very long way. Um, and the way we started, it wasn't even step one. It's step, step zero, like virtual step mocking. But then we started evolving. Uh, we started starting, uh, we started starting uh, local databases. So I just like brew install Mongo, brew install uh, MariaDB. Um, I hope there is brew uh, formula for it. Um, and others, um, we have them running locally. And that's already a huge advantage because we are no longer uh, mocking the stuff. But um, it's not as convenient. Plus, it's not cross-platform because uh, not all the things are running on Windows and all that. So it was an improvement. So yes, we started testing with real uh, databases, but not the improvement we needed uh, as an industry to transform how we reason about integration testing. So we started thinking about virtualizing. And we started um, uh, start realizing that uh, we need an abstraction for it. We need an abstraction that would allow us to start uh, all the things without building custom solution per database, per broker, per whatever. And um, an obvious solution back then uh, was VMs. And background was actually a really, really cool tool that would let you write uh, a descriptor for your, um, for your test dependencies. You do Vagrant up uh, and you're good to go. You have them running uh, and you have consistent experience uh, here and there. The problem with VMs is that they're a bit too heavyweight. If you need to start Redis, and Redis takes, I don't know, 10 megabytes of RAM to run, um, but you start Redis and you start Ubuntu or you start some other Linux distribution and boom, here goes 500 megabytes of your RAM on, on your computer just to start something as tiny as Redis. So this isn't efficient, uh, plus it was an infrastructure uh, slash platform component that leaked into development versus developer first approach. The next step in the revolution was obviously Docker. It solved the problem of the overhead of starting VMs and it gave us the abstraction we needed so much because um, Docker, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't the project that created containers. It wasn't the project that, uh, I don't know, came up with uh, great ideas about containers. Containers and all that containers existed before, but Docker, popular, popular, uh, Docker made it popular, made them popular. Um, and another thing that Docker did, um, one of the best things I would say is Docker registry. They made it very easy to share all the technologies we need to run because otherwise, like, how do I, for VMs, where do I get an ISO for Redis? Uh, where do I get that, that, and that? I think the biggest revolution that Docker did is the tooling for containers. And they gave us a very easy tool to build containers, to start them, to stop them, and all that. And they give us a really good tool for building images and sharing them. That was, uh, that's, that's the revolution uh, we are talking about here. And Docker was a major step towards uh, better integration testing uh, because we always needed the abstraction. That was the abstraction we needed. Not to mention that um, it is CI friendly, so we can have the same thing running on CI uh, that we run on desktop. So it removed this important aspect of doing testing, test, um, test consistency between different environments. Um, and we no longer need to ask our CI team to install uh, Postgres on Jenkins node ABC. And you obviously submit a Jira ticket because that's how you talk to your uh, infrastructure folks. Then three weeks later, they finally deploy Postgres to the Jenkins node. You submit a new ticket because you already upgraded Postgres in production to version uh, 9 point whatever. Um, you wait another three weeks. So that wasn't efficient. What Docker changed, it gave us an abstraction and an interface to collaborate with infrastructure folks because they only need to install Docker and then anything that you can start with Docker or actually anything you need uh, to run for a test can be started without, without communicating with your platform team uh, anymore. And Docker is cross-platform. No matter if you're running it on Windows, on Linux, on Mac, uh, you get the same consistent experience because under the hood is the same Linux containers, uh, either virtualized uh, for you, but only with one VM or natively supported on Linux. That it was much needed uh, improvement. Um, so there was Docker, but Docker alone, yes, they gave us the tooling, but is it the right level of abstraction we need? No, we need something to describe uh, what we want to start. And this is where FIG comes into play. Fig, also known as Docker Compose uh, today, 
was a project that would allow us to bring this vagrant experience, but to Docker. I write a file, I describe my uh, task dependencies uh, in that file, and then I do Docker Compose app or Fig app, um, similar to how I did vagrant app, but now I no longer run VMs, I run containers, uh, so it's much, much better. And it was a great tool. Um, like, it was so easy, and just like, look at it. Uh, I need Redis, I need Postgres, I need Elasticsearch. I just basically, chat GPT can generate it for me, really. Uh, there is no magic here. So Docker Compose was a great improvement, but there is always some, uh, something about it. It's a declarative YAML uh, format. And the problem I see with that is that uh, not everything you can describe declaratively. For example, Kafka. You cannot start Kafka on random ports with Docker Compose because Kafka needs to know its port uh, to, to tell to the client that, hey, I'm running on this port. When you connect to Kafka, you will always have to reconnect. And if Kafka is not aware of, uh, of its external port, you will be in trouble. I have a funny story. Um, I once spent multiple hours with my colleague. We were trying to debug Kafka-related issue. And apparently, he was starting Kafka on random port, and he had Kafka running uh, on static port. And he, he was connecting to that Kafka, started on random port, ephemeral Kafka. Kafka was telling, it, uh, was telling um, the client that, hey, I'm running on localhost 1992. Application successfully reconnected to localhost 1992 and proceeded running, but we never saw the events uh, in Kafka topic uh, with that random port because apparently it was redirecting us to another Kafka. So those details are important, but um, if it's declarative, we don't know the port uh, in advance because it's random. Um, and we don't have anything like we don't have, we cannot hook into lifecycle to change that. So there are some limitations of it. And I already talked extensively about port randomization, but for testing, isolation uh, is extremely important. You must be able to isolate your test. You don't want one test to infer with another, or you don't want your CI builds to fail because someone else is already running a build uh, with Redis uh, on the, that CI node. You want to isolate um, your individual test runs. And random ports is a must for proper isolation. And what if you want to run a container per test? Like what, uh, what if there is some state that you cannot reset, but you need to start fresh every time? With Docker Compose, you start it once and then you, you just run with it. Uh, you have no control over it. And it's an external tool. It's not part of your test. We talk about we as developers who used to do unit tests, now we want to upgrade to integration tests. But if we don't want to restart the whole process, we just want to upgrade. We want to add something to our unit test to gain more confidence, right? So last but not least, there is no ID integration. Like there is no clone and run experience where I just clone project and I run test. No, I clone project, I read with me, I follow all the commands that I need to run. There is also a section if you're running on Windows, good luck. So um, we don't want that. We want clone and run. Uh, read me's should be in the past. We should just be able to clone the project and get feedback uh, from test. Fig. So Fig was an improvement, but what we realized is that the way Fig works, it talks to Docker API, and Docker API is just some HTTP API. So why don't we do the same? Why can't we just talk to the Docker API directly and not use any intermediate tools such as Docker Compose and what's not? And actually, we can. Nothing stops us from doing so. Uh, every language has a HTTP client that we can use to talk to Docker. And that was a breakthrough moment. Um, but but uh, despite Docker being an abstraction, uh, there is always uh, a bit of pain to fight with your Docker environment. So if you're running with Docker desktop, it's one run docker.soc. If you're running Kalima, it will store Docker socket in a home folder. If you're running with Rancher desktop, it will write socket from Docker desktop. Or like, it is the abstraction we needed, but not the experience we wanted um, because of those differences. Uh, to get the abstraction consistent across uh, our environments. Um, not to mention that on CI, there are there is a thousand ways of running Docker, so Docker and Docker, Docker wormhole, uh, Docker sidecar, so many options. And we are also, we were so used to embedding or kind of hard coding localhost everywhere. But Docker changed that. Um, since we are running a VM, for a very long time, you couldn't even access your containers on localhost. You were supposed to use Docker machine's IP address, uh, and it still stays with uh, VSL2 and a few other uh, solutions for running Docker. So we need to get rid of those assumptions, uh, those dangerous assumptions about uh, how Docker is running. So 
a smart guy called Richard Norse, um, gave it a thought, like, what can we do to improve it? And he ended up creating task containers, a library, an open source library that would talk to Docker and utilize Docker from TAS to power integration testing. Now you can clone and run your TAS, and your TAS will be driving your external dependencies. So it becomes an embedded thing uh, in your testing scenarios, as opposed to something external, such as Docker Compose. And um, as I said, it's not just for Java, although our, our scope will be for Java, but test containers is available in multiple languages because it's not really the implementation that makes a difference, but the approach, the mindset of having your tests, almost unit tests, um, start their own dependencies because we can, because Docker allows us to do so. And this thing is super powerful because now you are, as a developer, in control of uh, your test environment, how you want to build it. And it's really up to you if you want a container per test or container per test session, or you want to bring some chaos testing to your, uh, to your testing scenarios, now you can. And my opinion on testing is that it was taken away from developers because the first test was performed by a developer. 50 years ago or whatever, when they did their first line of code, uh, it's probably always just like punching uh, something in the punch card, but nevertheless, uh, developer did that. And developer verified that uh, what, uh, what, they, what they did, what they wrote is working. But then somehow we moved to, okay, I don't want to do testing anymore. Let's, uh, let's have QA teams that will be, test will be doing testing for us. And we lost control of the quality of software we're creating. We are now waiting for someone else to tell us that our software is not working. But why, why would we? Uh, why can't we as developers uh, do the testing ourselves? And before Docker, before uh, the modern tools, the answer was because it's hard. It was actually very, very hard to do local testing, but it's no longer. And I'll show you how with test containers. So to repeat, test containers uh, is a library. It's not a framework, it's not a product, it's just a library that you add to your project and it becomes as simple as just instantiating objects. Like anyone can do that. Entry level developer can do that. Just write new Postgres container, new uh, Kafka container, new whatever container. You don't need to know Docker. You don't need to know how, uh, how to containerize uh, databases. It's there, available to you. Um, and it's as simple as, I don't know, using Apache Commons or whatever, any other library. Um, anyone can do that because any Java developer knows how to start uh, or how to create uh, objects, right? It's a no brainer. And um, if you think that, okay, like it sounds nice, but like, you know, like it's really a thing that people are using. Yes, people are using test containers. Um, and uh, earlier last year, um, ThoughtWorks even included test containers in their rather as uh, adopt um, among few other uh, really good things that they advocate. But we were so lucky, uh, we were so happy to see that because um, I loved uh, ThoughtWorks uh, rather. It's really good source uh, of knowledge and really good source of, uh, I discovered so many tools for, for the router. Um, so we were happy to see that, but why they did it? They wouldn't add it to, um, to their router if they didn't think that this is something that applies to almost everyone. It's not a niche thing, it's, uh, it's a generic thing. And it is, but what I'm gonna show you uh, today in the demo section uh, is uh, what, what does it look? to use uh, test containers uh, and how can we use test containers for, for our testing scenarios. So what we'll be testing here is a simple, of, uh, micro, is a simple microservice. Um, it exposes REST uh, API. It talks to Kafka, to Redis, and to Postgres. Um, and um, we'll not be doing calls some other microservices, but uh, you can also do that with test containers. Uh, you can also use mock server and others, um, but I'll focus on the main ones, Redis, Kafka, and Postgres. And here's a simple diagram of our application we'll be looking like. So we have a controller that um, uh, reads from the talks repository just to verify that the talks we're going to read exists. Um, then it sends an event to Kafka. There is a listener that listens to Kafka and writes the ratings to the repository so that later when we request the ratings, uh, we can show them. Uh, and there is a little bit of uh, eventual consistency and all that. So we want to make sure that uh, everything is working. And it's an advanced testing scenario. Like we have uh, three different technologies, uh, Redis, Kafka, and Postgres um, that we want to test with. And ideally we don't want to 
Um, we want O1 complexity for testing things. We don't want complexity to grow as soon as we add more databases to our services. We want a generic solution that works for any technology out there. So here goes the demo. Oh, uh, let me actually do the presentation mode. Oh, right. Awesome. So what we have here, uh, we have a typical Spring Boot application. You can also use task containers with any other framework out there. I just love Spring Boot. I also happen to be part of Spring Boot in the past, uh, but it's happened before the pandemic, so nobody remembers. So anyways, um, here I'll be using uh, Spring Boot. And what you see on the screen, there is no task containers involved here at all. Like what you see here isn't anything task containers. It's how you would write your test with uh, Spring Boot's awesome support for testing. So I'm just using test client. Uh, my first test is my most favorite test, by the way. It's an empty one. And shout out to the Spring team for automatically generating this test for you when you create a project on start.spring.io because there is a ton of value in this test. Do you know why? Like any guesses why empty test is so important? It's small, yes. Uh, it's, it's related to why it's important, but more guesses? Yes, exactly. This test, this test tests your testing setup. Too many testing, but uh, you get what I mean. So when your tests are failing, the first thing you should check if context starts at all. Because if it doesn't, obviously, duh, your test will be failing. But if your application is running, but some other tests are failing, that's an indicator that something is broken. So never remove this test. It's one of the best tests you can write. Uh, and this test alone will actually provide you a ton of coverage if you think about it. Um, but anyways, um, we test that context starts. Then we test some infrastructure related stuff. We check that our service is healthy. Um, we then proceed with business logic test. We submit talks to, uh, to the, like we submit ratings for the talks. And then we eventually expect, oh, come on IntelliJ. Um, and then we eventually expect ratings to return uh, the rating we submitted, and we submit more ratings and we get more uh, responses. So like, just me testing my business logic. By the way, this is availability, an amazing tool for testing eventual, consist uh, eventual consistency and like when you need to wait for something to return uh, eventually, uh, would highly recommend you. But so far as there wasn't any test containers. Now you see that um, this test implements integration test. Um, by the way, there are multiple ways of how you can connect uh, test containers to your test application. Uh, and some frameworks have an amazing integration for that. Uh, and I'll show you something that will be coming in Spring, Spring Boot 3.1. But uh, my favorite one is to implement an interface because uh, then you don't need to inherit from an abstract class uh, and you can reuse it between, um, between the tests. So anyways, what we have here, uh, we have task containers related stuff just in one place that it can use and then um, every other class will be reusing it. For GDBC based databases, it can be as simple as, starting, as setting a property. Test container supports magical URL here. So um, you just specify uh, the magical URL and boom, it will start Postgres for you. So you don't even need to code anything. You can actually put it to your application the properties and test folder. Um, so that's already great. But um, what if we need uh, something that is not GDBC? It's not that more complicated. Uh, as I said, it's just a few lines um, and we keep the promise. So here I'm using Redis and Kafka. And uh, for Kafka, we do have a module. And in fact, you will see that we are using uh, Kafka's uh, official images. In fact, if you're running Confluent platform, uh, then that's exactly the same image they would be using in production with their Kubernetes operator or what's not. So that's literally the same Kafka you run in production. And you have full control of the version two. If you're running Kafka 5.4 uh, in production, you should be testing with Kafka 5.4 in production. If you plan to migrate to Kafka 6, you can change your test first, test with Kafka 6, say, yes, my application is working with 5.x and 6.0, and then your uh, infrastructure team can proceed upgrading Kafka in production. This is very powerful because you can do it on your laptop, not on staging environment, not on CI, on your laptop. Just like, hey, Sergey, does your application work with Kafka? 
let's try. Uh, I mean, that's, that's how it works. Like, that's how it should be. Uh, our answer should always be, let's try. And if we cannot try those things on our uh, local development environment, we do have a problem. But with test containers, you can do this testing. And uh, that's for Kafka. But what if something is not supported by test containers? Does it mean that we need to wait for test containers team to support it? No. There is generic container abstraction that works with any Docker image out there, including your private, private, private uh, hidden images in your behind VPN uh, artifactory at your organization. As long as you can access this image uh, at network level, obviously, you can run it because it's later will delegate to Docker. Task Containers Project does not re-implement all these technologies. It does not re-implement uh, Kafka. It does not re-implement Redis. No, it gives you an abstraction to start those without knowing how to do it with, uh, or without caring about how to do it with Docker. You just get it. And last but not least, you need a bit of wiring code to connect your containers to your test application. In Spring Boot, you would be using something like dynamic property source, uh, or you keep your fingers crossed for 3.1 to be released as soon as possible because it will change it uh, in a much better way. But uh, even with uh, older versions of Spring, um, it's not too much code, really. But why do we have to do it? Why do we need to connect it? Why can't we just start Redis on 64, uh, 63, 49, or uh, 79, um, and other ports? Because we already talked about it, right? We want consistency, um, and we want isolation uh, between the tasks. So this is why test containers always starts containers on random ports. And you need to tell your applications that Redis is running on this host and port. But what's even better is that when it comes to Kafka, for example, I, as a developer, am asked to provide Spring Kafka Bootstrap servers. And um, I don't want to know how do, I, how do I form this URL. I want to inherit this knowledge from someone who knows Kafka. And because test containers is a library, you can build your abstractions on top. And for example, Kafka module, you can just go and check like, okay, Kafka, do you know how to get bootstrap, good bootstrap, uh, to get bootstrap servers? Yes. How do I, um, I know, do I get mapped, po uh, get mapped port? Boom, I can get the mapped port. Um, test containers gives you those, um, um, those APIs to not only start containers, but also to inspect them and also to inherit knowledge from uh, those who know Kafka uh, and other things without having to copy and paste large blocks of code. But anyways, uh, I think I've been talking for it, uh, about it for too long. Let's just run it. Let's just feel it. Like, and you're, like, guess how long it will take? Y you lose. OK, it took like a few seconds. <laughs> so if you're thinking that test containers and containers and Docker and what's not, starting with your dependencies takes a ton of time, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It takes seconds to get uh, feedback on all our tests. And um, it's not as fast as unit testing. It's not milliseconds, it's seconds. But it's still insanely fast compared to waiting for QA team to, uh, to return tomorrow to you with, uh, with this, this big list of uh, bugs uh, they discovered. Um, and in fact, uh, it removes the bottleneck because QA team becomes a bottleneck. But if we do this testing while we develop things, even before we commit to CI, we actually move a lot of confidence to earlier stage, to the moment where we create value, and then we validate it immediately. Another interesting thing is that um, what I did here uh, with, uh, with the previous test, I started the application, uh, I started full Spring Boot application, connected it to containers, and ran it. I needed Kafka, Redis, and Postgres to, to run it. But uh, what if I want to test slices of my application? So let's say I want to do repository test. Or maybe I want to replace mock in my repository test uh, with real database. You can do it with test containers as well. So for example, here I'm testing uh, the repository for ratings. And it uses, uh, it uses uh, Redis, as we discussed uh, before. So we'll start Redis container. We'll create a connection factory. And then we'll, uh, we'll be testing our repository. And in fact, why I find this test very, very interesting is because I would not be able to do it with my REST API. There is no REST API to uh, put long max value to the rating. You can only increase it one, uh, one by one. Um, but 
it's going to take a lot of time to submit a bazillion of uh, REST requests to increase it one by one before we reach long max value. But we still want to know what, what's going to happen if someone was waiting for the same token so, um, like so, so, so many times. Because I didn't know what's the behavior of Redis when you, when you add to something that was already at max value. Can you guess? Is it going to, like, OK, who thinks it's going to be an error? Like Redis would return an error. Redis is an amazing technology. They, like, it's, it's super stable, so it shouldn't return any error, right? Who thinks that it will handle it gracefully, uh, or like an overflow, or whatever? OK, cool. I don't remember. Let's run this test. We run this test, and here I'm making an assumption that uh, this test should pass, right? Because we just, uh, OK, it, it's so fast. I mean, I need, I need, I need to add some thread sleeps uh, just to be able to talk while I'm running tests. Anyways, um, here in development, I was able to verify the behavior of Redis uh, because I made an assumption that it will handle it gracefully. But apparently, I'm getting an exception. If I look at it, it says Redis system exception, error in execution, increment or decrement would overflow. So apparently, there is a protective check uh, inside Redis uh, for overflowing um, um, the numbers. That is something I didn't know how Redis behaves, uh, despite me using it for, for 10 years. Uh, actually, my first integration testing framework, uh, integration testing project was a Maven plugin to start Redis, even before Docker, task containers, and all of that. But this is how you turn your assumptions about databases that you're using into something runnable Something you can document, by the way, because test is the best documentation ever. Uh, you can follow tests and understand how your application behaves. And you can stop making assumptions and start validating things. Not wait for someone from the infrastructure team to tell you how Redis behaves, but rather here, validate it yourself as a developer. So we gain more control. And let me show you um, one more quick thing. I already said that, um, sorry, uh, I already said that there is something coming in spring. Um, why? Won't, OK, cool. So Spring Boot, nice framework. Um, and um, what I love about Spring Boot is that uh, you always get um, this like, convention over configuration. I think that's what it's called. Uh, like, you get a lot of it. Um, there is a lot of knowledge behind a simple annotation, uh, a simple annota uh, annotation, yeah, annotation, um, and that you don't need to worry. Like Spring Boot to microservices, what test containers to testing, basically. And um, what's coming in uh, Spring Boot 3.1 is uh, there are new support uh, for two things. Thing, thing number one, uh, there is support for uh, better test containers integration, and another one is support for local development because. Automated testing isn't the only way of doing testing. Sometimes you want to start the thing uh, and go explore or send some requests to uh, endpoints. Um, like sometimes you just want to see your application running, right? So as you can see in this project, I no longer have containers defined here. But instead, I'm just uh, adding test containers environment configuration uh, to the classes that Spring Boot should be using for testing. And then here, I no longer need to use uh, dynamic property source or anything like that. Instead, I define a beam for container. I mark it as service connection, and that's the best part. Uh, that's task, a Spring Boot test containers module that will automatically connect it to Postgres, to Kafka configuration, to what's not. And it's extendable too, so you can uh, write your custom ones. So now I have this simple class with two beams for Postgres and for, for for, uh, for Postgres and for Kafka. And I can run my test in a similar way. So as you can see, uh, it's not the same uh, scenario, um, test scenario, but uh, it, it gets drilled. And as you can see, since, spoiler, I'm using Test Containers Cloud here, but uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't download the images before. But Test Containers will download the images for me, and you get this clone and run behavior no matter what you're running or whatever you're running. It will take care of, uh, of it for you. And the best thing is that it will ensure that the containers are terminated after you run your test. You will never have containers still running on your machine just because you forgot to call a stop or maybe your shutdown hooks were not executed. No, test containers will take care of, uh, take care of it for you, um, which is very, very important um, for testing because we run tests 
so often that we don't want any leftovers to be um, to be there. So test containers just downloaded the image, and now uh, the test is passing. Um, and if you if I rerun it again, then it will run much faster, obviously. Um, so the test is working, but this isn't cool. Like we already uh, saw the test passing uh, in, our, in our previous demo, but let's look look at something else. Um, starting things locally. I already uh, say, uh, said something about it, but let me demonstrate uh, you how it's gonna look like. And maybe it's subject to the change, maybe not, it's still an RC phase, uh, but this is super exciting stuff. That's already super exciting stuff because while well, previously I had to duplicate my uh, test setup for manual testing for starting applications locally. So I should, um, I should have something like Docker Compose or something else, um, but now, I can just um, reuse the same uh, containers configuration when I start the test application as well. So for example, here I can just uh, start the application and it will start the same set of containers, but now for local development and not for testing. And I think this is game changing uh, thing because starting applications locally is hard. We are no longer using something like LAMP stack where I just install like uh, Linux, Apache, whatever, MySQL, uh, whatever, whatever. Um, yeah, I have really bad memory, but it's becoming harder and harder and harder. We now have Kafka, we now have Red Panda, we now have uh, Cockroach uh, DB. We have like, a ton of stuff um, that we need to start locally and the complexity is growing. But this brings, back the, brings the complexity back to all from one because now, if we already have this test set up, we can just reuse it for local development. And that's really cool. I can just go and uh, do some queries. You know, let me uh, add a product, boom, done. Um, and as you can see on the right side, it's now in the database. I can add a second, uh, or actually, let me show you something else. Since Spring Boot supports uh, DevTools mode, what we can do, we can go and change this here, recompile the class, I'm doing the right thing, boom. And we already have a new version of our application running. So I submit a second product in less than a second. And as you can see, the, st the state is preserved. So I keep the containers running even if I restart my application uh, because DevTools will take care, uh, take care of it for me. And I can iterate on my application while locally developing it uh, without having to restart it uh, every time, without having to restart containers every time with clone and run behavior. So I just clone project, I start test application and I'm good to go. Yes, time check. Did you say that was, is that because of Spring Boot's um, uh, dev tools or is that a test containers feature that allows it to kind of reach in and do the redeployment yes. without it's, restarting the containers? It's the best of both worlds. Uh, Test containers providing those containers yeah. and Spring Boot providing an easy way to start them and okay. also preserve, preserve them between the runs. And uh, I'm also showing you some things that I didn't even show to uh, most of the uh, Spring Boot team. Sure. But this single annotation actually makes the whole difference because now it says that, okay, this bin should be preserved between, uh, between the restarts. And while usually you would do it for beans that are, I don't know, expensive to create or store some state, containers are obviously very expensive to create. So we don't want to recreate them every now and then. We don't want to lose the state. But you just add this one annotation and boom, you're good to go. How cool is that? Um, so that's really amazing. And let me do my last thing when it comes to this demo, because there was a bit of a clickbait in the title saying like you can run your tests on your desktop, on your CI. It's the very same thing runs on CI, uh, obviously, because it's the same Docker and all that. But there was also mention of coffee machine. So what did I mean by coffee machine? Um, so no, we are not going to run our tests on coffee machine right now, um, but I referred to, uh, to, the project that we, to the product that we created called Test Containers Cloud because not everyone can run Docker on their machine, or not everyone wants to run Docker on their machine, or not everyone has CIs that supports Docker, and many, many, many other reasons why uh, Test Containers Cloud. But I will focus on one, consistency of Test Containers experience across any environment you would run your test in. And to demonstrate you the extreme of the consistency, 
I'm going to switch to my HDMI adapter here, uh, HDMI input adapter. And here you see Raspberry Pi. It's Raspberry Pi 400. And um, obviously, I don't have Docker on it. Obviously, I couldn't even run Docker on it. In fact, it's ARM. It makes it even, even worse. Uh, I am using Test Containers Cloud on this laptop because it's Apple M2 laptop, and like containers that I started uh, won't start on Apple, or some of them won't start, uh, especially consistency on uh, consistently on Apple Silicon. But here's my extreme: my to be connected to coffee machine controller. Um, this is why I refer to coffee machines. Raspberry Pi with just a little bit of RAM, a little bit of CPU. But what you should see here, and if you're attending. Online, this is Raspberry Pi. Yep, I'm, I'm not faking the demo. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this is my CI instance. That's a small container orchestrated with Tecton, GitLab, GitHub Actions, whatever. Uh, my CI instance on which I want to run my test containers-based tests. And test containers open source works with any Docker. But you need, to, you need to have Docker. It's a hard requirement because you need to have the container runtime to run it with. It also works with Rancher desktop, it works with Podman, works with other Docker alternatives. But at the end of the day, you need to have Docker. And if you are um, if you're running on your ARM-based CI uh, infrastructure or containerized CI infrastructure or whatever infrastructure, you don't have Docker there. But Test Containers Cloud, uh, the project that we created, is a tiny agent that you can run that doesn't require any privileges, which is great for security. And it allows you to run even the most heavyweight test containers based tests on underpowered devices or on uh, restricted devices. So what I'm doing here, as you can see, it started running. And I hope it's big enough uh, for you to see. But um, I'm running the tests, and not just the tests. I'm running four rails of tests. And as you can see at the bottom, I see H, oh, I have HTOP showing the CPU utilization. And yes, there are some spikes to compile uh, Java or to start Spring Context or whatever, uh, or actually to execute the test. But we give 100% of uh, our CI instance resources to the tests themselves, allowing us to run tests in parallel, because we only run JUnit code. We only run our Java code. We don't run any of the containers. And on the right side, you, you see four rails of containers. Uh, so we actually aren't just running it with one session. We're running it in four sessions. But you can start parallelizing your CI without changing your CI configuration, which is amazing because uh, most of the CIs, uh, it's actually pretty uh, challenging to run tests in parallel on them. But you don't need to, uh, if you move containers out of your CI executor, if you decouple them, because it becomes one to many relationship. One test runner can now run multiple test sessions um, with zero changes to the CI config. And um, despite it being Raspberry Pi, like pretty slow device, although I'm actually impressed with the latest uh, editions. Um, here we ran uh, our tests in one minute, uh, 10 seconds. And we ran. Um, 100,000 uh, messages sent and, uh, and read from Kafka in four parallel uh, test classes. So that's a lot of requests going on. But because we run it in parallel, we, we uh, pipeline them, and we get results very, very fast, even if I'm constrained by resources of my machine. So if you have this question of, OK, test containers are nice, but containers, like I don't have containers uh, uh, at my organization, or maybe I don't want to. You don't have to uh, if you're using Test Containers Cloud. Um, and sorry for a bit of a kind of commercial pitch, but uh, the good thing is that you can go and try it uh, at any moment of time. Just go to testcontainers.cloud, and it's free to try uh, and all that. And um, it's a very easy way to start with Test Containers if you didn't use it before, because you don't need to uh, add this additional step of, do I have the right environment? Like, Do I have Docker configured uh, correctly and all that? You just Start with them, you run, and then you make your call uh, whether you want to continue or not. But um, it's the easiest way to start with test containers. So I hope you enjoyed uh, these demos. Yes, question from the room? Mm -hmm. So my question is, this one just happened over the cloud, not on the Raspberry Pi that you have. Yes? 
Yes, that is correct. The question was, uh, did it happen uh, in the cloud? Uh, were, uh, were some containers running on Raspberry Pi? No, no containers were running on Raspberry Pi, only the Java code that orchestrated this, the thing and the tests themselves that you didn't need to send to test containers cloud, but they continued running on uh, Raspberry Pi. But containers, the heavy part of your testing, were running in the cloud, but you didn't notice it because it's a transparent, uh, um, transparent solution for test containers based tests. Sure, thank you. That's a good question, Tom. Thank you. I imagine it's also pretty useful if you are trying to replicate a really complicated environment and you start running out of space on your laptop, right? I mean, if you have like a database or five databases and yes. message queue plus, I don't know, a bunch of other middleware that could, unless you have a pretty beefy machine, I could see you kind of running out of, you know, running out of resources at some point too. That's definitely the case. Uh, yeah. And um, it, even though you're uh, growing the complexity of your test setup, uh, right. it will feel the same. And what's also important is that um, Right now, when you run your integration tests, if you run them with local containers, then basically like, you go and make yourself a coffee because it requires a lot of CPU to start containers for obvious reason, but then it introduces interrupts in your development process and it forces you to context switch while running the test. It's still a matter of minutes, but that's a context switch that you need to do while running the test. While if you offload your containers to the cloud, you can run your test, it will consume, I know, 5, 10% of your CPU, and you can actually continue coding, or maybe you can enable after testing mode, and then you'll just be coding and continuously getting feedback on your, um, on your application, and then boom, you refactored one class, you thought that you didn't break anything, but apparently you did, because those tests are now failing. You can now uh, enable that, uh, that behavior. Yeah, and I, I mean, if you're trying to test with like, the closer the closer you get to trying to test what your production environment looks like, right? The better the better off you are, you know. And that could take a bunch of forms: the data, the size of the data in your database, the amount of systems. So I can see a lot of benefits there. Just not just reducing laptop performance, but like being able to more closely closely approximate what a production environment might look like because you're not constrained. Totally. Um, if anyone else has questions, please jump in. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind using the mic, it'll just it'll help folks on the stream hear you. You have to uh, keep it a little close. I was just curious about uh, like a proprietary technologies, like you know everybody's in the cloud. Like we're using DynamoDB, we're using Cosmos DB. Like, do you have like existing solution? Like, if you actually want to write integration tests with those? Awesome question. Um, it reminded me about something important to share because, uh, as I say, there is quite a bit of test containers adoption. But what's happening now is other vendors, uh, such as Local stack, which is a solution for testing AWS resources such as DynamoDB, SQS, S3, and many, many others, uh, or I know, CockroachDB, or Red Panda, or MariaDB, hopefully, wink, wink, yep. Um, they are joining test containers as official module partners, meaning that they start advocating test containers as a preferred way to test and develop with their technologies because those modules make the whole difference. It's no longer YAML you copy from one project to another. It's an actual module that maintained uh, in collaboration with the vendor, bringing you the best practices of testing with their technologies. And uh, the reason why I was talking about it, because local stack is one of the official modules, um, and you can test DynamoDB and other things uh, with local stack, and it's very, very convenient. Uh, let me just quick, quick one. Um, go to testcontainers.org, uh, go to, mo okay, no. I will not do it like this. I'll go to testcontainers.com, which is a place for all things test containers, um, including uh, other languages too, because there is Go, there is .NET, there is Node.js and others. I will go to modules because I'm excited that we launched it. I look for local stack, or maybe I just want to look for cloud testing. Okay, there is a number of solutions, but I check local stack. I go to the Java documentation and boom, here we have local stack testing, uh, local stack this test with S3, same, same, uh, same approach applies. Like a couple of lines of code and you're good to go. And um, local stack supports many services. So here you see S3, SQS, CloudWatch logs, uh, KMS, uh, um, Dynam uh, DynamDB obviously and others. Um, but we are not re-implementing those services. It's local stack who does it. Um, 
And there are also um, other clouds that support it. So you asked the question about uh, Cosmos DB by Azure. Um, and Azure, uh, Azure module that we have provides Cosmos DB uh, container that you can start from your test with the same API, same test container sub API. The abstraction you need to adopt once and be able to test almost anything you would ever need. So that's, that's, that's a really good question because uh, I completely forgot to mention this exciting thing with official modules. Thank you. So um, if you have like maybe 10 or 15 dependencies like of uh, local services mm -hmm. that you don't want to uh, instantiate as containers, is mock server a solution that you recommend? So mock server, uh, if you're referring to concrete implementation, yeah, mock server is one of them. Uh, as an abstract answer, yes, some network level mocking or test doubles uh, is, in my opinion, the way to go because of the transitive dependencies. Uh, because if you start services you need to talk to, those services may also need some service to talk to, and then you end up starting your whole production uh, fleet uh, in a firmer manner and waiting for hours for it to spin up uh, properly. And it's, like, it's actually a pretty complex thing uh, to do. But if you limit um, if you limit the scope to just your service and test doubles, um, maybe with addition of contract testing, maybe not. Um, it's optional, but it's very helpful. Then you can test the service without having to start other services. And by the way, it will also allow to describe contract of how microservices interact with each other. Ideally, you want to see that I'm not just like talking to other service. But I want to see that I'm sending this request to that service and I expect that responses. And then I sit with, with a team providing that service and I review with them, hey, is it, is it how you're going to respond? Uh, or did I make a wrong assumption here? But it's reviewable and it's visible to uh, teams. So it brings better collaboration between the teams versus I'll just start their service and I ho I'll hope that uh, everything is working. Um, because it's, it's something desirable, I understand it. I understand why. Why would people want to start everything to not have to maintain test doubles uh, or whatever? Just it's not scalable, unfortunately, uh, due to the nature of uh, the whole thing. So mock server is something which is in the test double category? Yes, and I can demonstrate how mock server uh, based code would look like. So in this particular example, let me make it bigger. I create a mock server container. Then I say when I request a, a request, HTTP request to slash person with the following query, query parameter, then I should res return this response with this body. It will probably be JSON or uh, your preferred uh, protocol, but um, same thing, um, you know, like same, same, thing, same thing applies. Uh, I'm just defining almost like I do mocks, but instead of doing code level mocks, I do them with network interactions that can be re uh, reviewed. And unlike code mocks uh, that make assumptions about the implementation, those interactions actually are always contract-based. We're not just sending random, hey, run this query for me. No, we send requests to, okay, I want to create person with this parameter. So I want to get a list of users, or I want to do that and that and that and that. And contract testing is how you automate it. But even without contract testing, you can do it uh, with, um, Test doubles. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Uh, so the second question I have is it possible, I'm not sure even, that like Tomcat, that is part of a package inside a Spring Boot, you package you know, the whole Docker as well. And just instead of you know installing Docker on your desktop, you run, I mean, you just run your test code. I mean, is it a possibility or a feature that you can think of in future as well? So if I understand the question correctly, um, the question is for for Spring or my Spring application, application to run, uh, it needed some application server such as Tomcat, um, and the question was. Did I use test containers to start Tomcat so that my Spring Boot application would start, or uh, it was a feature of Spring Boot? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. My question is, just imagine right now, I mean, you used to have Tomcat server running, then you mm -hmm. upload your you know, code, and you yes. are running your application. 
but now it's already packaged as in as and it's inside the you know a Spring Boot app. I mean server, mm -hmm. I mean, a Spring Boot code. You can run your HTTP server there. Yes. But just imagine you have your test containers part of a package that you don't have. You don't need to install Docker on your desktop. It's already running. I mean, as soon as you start it, it installs the Docker for you, and it starts the containers. I mean, the test containers then, mm -hmm. and you can run it. Is it a possibility or no? Do you think? I want to make sure that I understand the question correctly because things are multiple layers. But if the question, if the question is can test containers install docker for you like bring test con can test containers bring docker with with it is that the question no it's, uh, what i was Sorry. saying is there's a possibility that uh i mean maybe not your company but the docker itself to become a package inside i mean a spring boot to run this i mean docker then you don't have to have it installed then run the test container containers I'm not sure you got it. <laughs> so My favorite thinking, question yeah, is, is what are we trying to solve? I'm um, trying to solve the problem of not installing Docker on your machine. Just as mm -hmm. soon as you run your test code, it will install the Docker itself. Okay. And then we'll run the test containers based on that. Yeah, I got it. Um, I, I got the question. So uh, we could. We could, but uh, Docker as a technology, uh, it's a bit more advanced than just running a process. It requires you to install it, give root privileges to your machine to install all the system packages and all that. So unfortunately, as much as, much as we want it uh, to be so, we cannot automatically install Docker for you. It comes as a prerequisite. It doesn't if you use uh, Test Containers Cloud, but that's a different story. Uh, but for Docker itself, it's just too heavy of a package to, um, to install. It's basically like, it's almost like chicken egg problem or imagine like installing Java. You do it before you, you run your test. You cannot have your tests uh, uh, install Java for you. Uh, also, some build tools can do it for you, but you still need to bootstrap them. So at the moment, Docker as a technology requires too many privileges to be able to be ran as a lightweight standalone process or something like this. Maybe in the future, we will finally be able to do so, but not now due to the virtualization. Are there any plans to officially support alternative runtimes like uh, Podman or Docker compliant infrastructure? Any Docker API compatible runtime works with test containers, uh, including Podman, Rancher, Desktop, Kalima, and others. Uh, it must be Docker API. Uh, we are not multi API solution because if we, if we were to support multiple APIs, such as Podman API, Kubernetes API, and others, then we'll have to find a common denominator between all those APIs. Uh, because the best thing about test containers is that you don't need to worry will it run or not on that machine or other machine. You always know that it will. But um, for testing scenarios, you need, uh, you need an advanced API to be able to run all the things you, uh, you want to. And uh, for example, we get a lot of questions from the community. Um, can test containers uh, target Kubernetes? Let's say, so we have a Kubernetes cluster. Can I just start containers in Kubernetes? You can start containers with Kubernetes, but you cannot achieve what you can achieve with Docker API, Docker API in, in containers. Because I'll give an example. What you can do with test containers in just a few lines of code, you can create a network, you can start, uh, let's say, you can start Kafka, you can start something else, and then you can say, what happens to my application if I disconnect Kafka from network? So we can do chaos testing, for example, with the same tool. Not possible with Kubernetes because Kubernetes is declarative. You cannot say disconnected from network or connected to network. You don't have those abstractions because Kubernetes is already an abstraction. We are at the same level with Kubernetes when it comes to consuming container API. So um, just to give you a perspective on why Docker API and only Docker API is because it's powerful. It's the most powerful API out there for integration testing. And we are not ready to downgrade uh, the features of the library to support more APIs, but we rather encourage Podman and others, and we work with Podman team on ensuring the compatibility with uh, test containers, but it's their responsibility to be compatible with Docker API. Cool. Hey, a uh, question from the live from the YouTube stream uh, from Dimitri Ney. I think I'm saying, I hope I'm saying his name right. A question for you, uh, Sergey, obviously, is there a preferred way to provision a seed data 
into databases in the world of test containers. That's funny. We were, you and I were just talking about this a second ago. Something more modern than DB unit, for example. I mean, DB unit is a good start, I would say. Um, so I'll just show what I was using in my uh, first demo. Um, Spring Boot can uh, provision data for you. It can, uh, so we have data.sql and it will, um, it will create the data if you have schema.sql uh, that I should have somewhere here. Uh, so yeah, schema.sql and then Spring Boot was, uh, would also create those tables for me. Um, and in general, you have the following three strategy. You can have your framework uh, create uh, data for you. For example, it can be Spring Boot, it can be Flyway, it can be Liquid Base, it can be whatever you prefer. It can be GB, DB unit as well. The second option would be to let test containers uh, do the provisioning and calling the init script. And this is actually what I have here. So instead of, just give me a sec. Ah, no, that's not exactly what I wanted. So instead of letting Spring Boot provision the schema for me, I'm mapping schema inside the container. So Postgres will apply the schema when it starts. Um, and I have uh, convenient methods, for example, to put a file I have on my class pass into a running container. And then it's the same thing here, like schema.sql. Um, and when container starts, because Postgres supports um, uh, initializing, in, initializing the schema, uh, it will run the script and will provision uh, the schema for you. And the third option is the most advanced one, but you can always pre-bake your uh, custom image of Postgres with schema, with some seed data, with whatever you want. Uh, and you can also use some, uh, some products such as Synthesized and others uh, that would synthesize the data for you, not obfuscate your production data, but create a set of data based on the machine learning models they built uh, in production without leaking any uh, personal data into development. Uh, that's a really, really cool stuff. Uh, I encourage you to check it's called Synthesized. Like, really good stuff. Um, and they have a module for test containers too. Um, um, so if you, want, if you want to use it, uh, then I encourage you to use it. So it's the flexibility you inherit. Uh, and I don't know why I was looking there because I should really be looking there because question from, from the online audience, but um, Test containers always give you the flexibility and it's not that opinionated about things unless those things are critical to how integration should be done, integration testing should be done, such as random ports. But other than that, you have different options and you pick the one that is most convenient for you. Cool, and if you're live on the stream, this is a great time for uh, additional questions. So please bring it, folks. And uh, thank you, Dimitri, on the YouTube stream for, for asking that. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll keep it on the chat if you want to ask other questions. Uh, and over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question is about the security. So like, can you elaborate a little bit more about your cloud offering in terms of, I was thinking, you know, the CI environment, it, it's kind of usually like a sacred place and you don't want to let anyone else in and like don't have the public access to the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So like, what, what can you tell about, a little bit more about that? So um, security is indeed a very important thing for us when it comes to product, because our product, first of all, helps with security. You no longer need to have uh, root access uh, on your CI instances uh, if you're running with Test Containers Cloud, uh, because Docker does require root access uh, and create a security problem and a really tough conversation with security folks and uh, CIOs. Uh, but um, since Test Containers Cloud agent is user space agent, then um, it doesn't require any privileges uh, from the runner and can literally put it be, uh, before Maven test uh, or a Gradle uh, verify or whatever. So that answers the part about uh, how Test Containers Cloud helps with security on CI pipelines. Now to answer your question, uh, what should we do if our um, CI system is restricted? We don't have internet access or something like that. So for that, um, as you can see on this diagram, um, the virtual machines, yes, we do host them in public SaaS if you're using our public SaaS offering, but we also have a special offering uh, that's more enterprise friendly uh, where those VMs that run containers will be running in your infrastructure. And then you will never be leaving your uh, security um, counter um, and 
even though containers will not be running on the CI instance, they will be running in your own infrastructure, be able to access your private image, private images and private registers and whatever, um, without compromising any of the security, but giving you um, lean, fast, small CI workers and the power of containers for testing. The question, mm -hmm. The question was like, who is managing those uh, instances that you were talking about? Is it your responsibility or is it our responsibility to install some software to actually manage those? Yeah, using test containers, cloud, public SaaS, you can think of GitHub Actions, for example. You can have GitHub Actions that are hosted by Microsoft. I love GitHub Actions, by the way. Um, but you can use publicly hosted uh, workers or you can connect your own workers to the same GitHub Actions and then run it in your infrastructure uh, with your security requirements and all of that. So you'll no longer be using uh, instances that are uh, managed by Microsoft, but those images, yes, will be managed by you and uh, you have a solution to run them to scale up and down and all of that in your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That one how do you, how do you pay for it? Like what 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 the like the pricing? So like if if I run it in my infrastructure. So speaking of the pricing, just to set the expectation, you ask for it. I I, I didn't talk about it. you ask for it, um, but to make it clear, um, all this awesomeness with cloud and all that, uh, you get it twenty four per seven on desktop for seventeen bucks a month, which is pretty good deal, I would say. Um, and on CI, you get usage-based pricing because we cannot predict how much you're going to consume. Like on desktop, it's obvious. You will never consume more than 24 multiplied by uh, 31 multiplied by whatever. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, on CI, you can go like really wild. Uh, you can scale your pipelines. Uh, so it's usage-based pricing on CI. And if you're running it in your own infrastructure, let's talk. That's, that's the answer I'll give, but basically it will also be usage-based pricing just Adopt it to uh, your needs uh, because obviously you no longer have to pay the price of the instances to us because you will be hosting those instances yourself. Of course. I was curious, uh, is it possible to run those instances on like a function as a service, like a Lambda or something? Like to even like reduce the cost down. So like I don't need to run those instances all the time, right? So like I run the Lambda, I like run your worker, then like it will ship the containers and then like I will run my test on them. I love the questions, but I want to clarify. No, I did not ask Constantine to ask those questions. I'm actually <laughs> surprised that you're asking them. So um, one thing I didn't mention about Test Containers Cloud, it's it follows a serverless approach. So you are not running those instances 24 per, 24 per seven. You're leasing them when you need to when you need them and you're releasing them when you don't need them. That also applies to your uh, hybrid uh, privately hosted uh, test containers cloud instance. It's not, uh, it's not workers that you're running. It's an appliance that you install and it will talk to cloud provider. For example, if you install it in AWS or GCP or whatever, you can also install it on Kubernetes uh, and it will be starting VMs when needed and shrink them down when you don't need them. So if you are not actively using Test Containers Cloud in your organization, you'll only be running, let's say, one EC2 instance uh, to be able to immediately respond. Uh, so there is always one hot instance, but uh, the cost of one instance is, uh, I don't know, 200 bucks uh, a month or so. Uh, so minimum cost of running Test Containers Cloud is very, very low. More? Okay, no, no you, you, it's fine, there's no limit. Okay. Um, uh, Phil, cover your ears. Um, there's a question here from um, uh, Ganesh about uh, how does it work with Quarkus and Micronaut? Any examples? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I may have some dumps on my machine or maybe not, but it does work with Quarkus and Micronaut in a very, very similar way to what you saw here. Um, actually, the upcoming, um, upcoming support for local development in Spring Boot will finally bring consistency to all Java frameworks, all popular Java frameworks when it comes to local development because all of them support local developer, development with test containers. And uh, if, you, if you are using Quarkus uh, for local development, they have uh, dev services, I think it's called. Um, and they will be starting containers with test containers. Um, 
automatically for you when you start your application for local development. Or uh, if you're running tests, there is uh, test resources support, uh, and there are a few other things uh, they do to start test containers uh, based instances for you. And in Micronoft, uh, actually, they have something very interesting. In Micronoft, uh, they do it with test resources. And it's build, build to slow of integration. But uh, yeah, same, uh, same test container stuff. As you can see, they mentioned test containers in their documentation. Not everyone does, but you know, some do. Um, anyways, instead of making it part of your application, they let the build system maintain them on a side. And then when application started, we just ask, hey, give me Postgres. And it will lazily start Postgres and return it to you. If you ever use Cloud Foundry, there was a service, uh, service connectors, if I remember correctly, it was called, um, that was also lazily pro uh, provisioning uh, infrastructure pieces for you. It's a similar exp experience there. So even though I was using uh, Spring Boot as my example, uh, just as my go-to example, there are examples in other languages, and you can easily find them when you Google for let's say, test containers, Quarkus. Uh, yeah, just Google. Oh, there is a guide uh, on Quarkus guides uh, that talks about how to use test containers with Quarkus. And if we scroll down a little bit, we should see something very, very similar to what we just discussed. Um, if I just test containers, okay, right. Uh, Ah, it's funny. There was some CO optimization for test container entry. Okay, finally. Um, so as you can see, it's a very similar thing. You start the container, uh, you get the GDBC URL, and then you return a map of properties uh, to which uh, it should map uh, the values to. Uh, and the same thing in Micronaut. So test containers, cloud, uh, test containers uh, is a library, open source library in Java that can be used from any framework, including your custom private framework that nobody's seen other than you. Um, it's just, I was using Spring Boot for an example, as an example. I think that's it for questions from the live stream at the moment. Uh, anyone else? Don't be shy. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. I... Uh, just kind of like a philosophical question. You mentioned in the beginning that you're against like generating tests if they're mm -hmm. not reviewed by like other team members, right? Like I literally taught my team like a week ago, like I showed them the live demo with the chat GPT, like mm -hmm. how to generate those tests. And like, I guess that's pretty cool tools that like we have right now. Like what's your thoughts about it so like, in general? My opinion is that if AI can generate tests for you or help you write tests, then your test framework isn't powerful enough because your test framework should be very concise and like it should allow you to express what you want to test in just a couple of lines of code. If you need uh, GitHub Copilot to generate 30 lines of code to test some functionality, you can just hide it behind some abstractions that you are currently lacking. We don't need AI for that. We need better abstractions and testing. And when it comes to actual tests, like how we write them, um, I see a ton of value in the process of writing tests. I'm, I'm not in favor of TDD where I first write a test and only then I write an implementation. No, I always write my tests uh, after I change my code or after I implement something. But at the same time, when I write my test, first of all, I'm the first consumer of my API and I can be like, oh wow, it's really hard to, to consume this API. I didn't realize it when I was writing REST controller, but when I started consuming it, I realized that immediately. Um, and uh, other, many other aspects of the process of creating tests. It's a creative process that helps you um, turn some of the assumptions, uh, some, of, uh, um, some of the mindset you had when you were writing application and do it again, but as a consumer of your application. I would fight to death to not allow AI to generate it for me because then I will be losing this experience and I'll be losing confidence in my application because it's basically like, it's like QA teams, just automated. Like, I don't want QA teams to go to, to, to return to me and say that uh, my application is working correctly. No, I want to verify it for myself because I want to be in this creative mode of thinking how my application will be consumed and how it behaves and turning it into code that I can execute later and rerun uh, multiple times. Yeah, makes sense. My biggest selling point was that it just speeds up the 
the time of development you know that when you have like some business logic you have like ifs here and there like you're like executing your code and then like you're just like giving it to the chat gpt and just like generating like all those like five, 150 lines of code and like everything is amazing but i see a point that like it's actually like really valid like when you actually feel how your functions are performing and like how you will be using them as the api level like you will actually be able to easily understand that like oh this is not the correct level of abstraction like i need to rewrite this code mm -hmm. um I totally see value in smoke testing with uh, AI. Like in smoke testing, you're you're not verifying any assumptions, just checking that the thing is working. Like it starts, or like you know, like endpoint actually returns something. So don't get me wrong, uh, I'm not against of uh, AI for everything. Uh, I just think that there's niche in testing where AI can help, and I think better use of AI is to be someone sitting on your uh, shoulder and telling you. Hey, did you test this scenario? Like, I couldn't find it uh, when I looked at your code base uh, and you're currently writing tests, so don't forget to test this scenario. And you're like, oh, yeah, I have that if in my uh, source code where um, for that particular type of user, I'm having different behavior. So AI should help us create tests, but we should not expect AI to do it for us because that's, that's counterintuitive. Uh, when we go back to the basics, when we ask ourselves why we are doing testing in the first place, like, what's the value of testing for us? It isn't about just writing something that will increase cost, it will increase code coverage. It's the process of us getting confidence in the software that we are creating and uh, ensuring the uh, ensuring uh, the confidence and ensuring that our software is working correctly. Thank you. And thank. And thank you, because I was going to ask, I was I sort of had the back of my mind, the chat GPT question, as we all do these yep. days. So thank you for taking that one on the nose, because yeah, I think it's I think it's relevant. Thank you. That's that's a good sort question. It's a very relevant one, one. Dispel the myth, right? You know, yep. a little bit. It's yep. like, maybe it'll maybe it'll automate some level of, of drudgery in terms mm -hmm. of writing unit tests or something, you know, but... Uh, my opinion on GitHub Copilot, it's a great way to identify boilerplate. Like... If sure. Copilot can generate something for you, you have boilerplate. The only question is, can you avoid the boilerplate with the right abstractions? Or maybe your language is not expressive enough, so you have to have boilerplate going and looking at you if error not equals uh, new, uh, do something. Um, but in reality, uh, a lot of examples of Copilot, uh, when I look at them, I'm just like, yeah, but like I, that could be a function. And in Going, for example, we have a really good standard library. You can do crazy things in just a few lines of code. It's a really good standard library. We don't have that in Java. In Java, like yesterday, I had to write a function that would download the file, change permissions of that file, and execute that file as a sub-process in Java. Don't ask me why, but um, I had to do it. And I mean, I'm a Java champion. I've been using Java for so long, and I always have to Google those things. It's counter, like it's so, like it's not intuitive at all how to do it in Java. And I always forget all these new functions they add and like thousands of overloads we have in the standard library. I know how to do it in, uh, in Golang because it's easy there. And I think we need more of those standard libraries in Java to be as efficient. We don't need Copilot for that. We don't, not, we don't need to generate this code every time we need to download the file. We need to have a method that would do it for us. And this is also why we have uh, frameworks. Uh, this is why a single annotation, like behind, I don't know, like look, I looked at this annotation and there are probably hundreds of lines of code behind this single annotation. But I don't want to copy this code from one project to another. I want to put this annotation and actually rely on experience uh, uh, of Theo and uh, the rest of the Spring Boot team. Um, like, I don't want to have it in my code base, but that's what we need, not a code generator. Cool. Just curious. Yep. Me too. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, Spring had its had its moment with code generation, right, Phil? You know, a well, long, long time ago. And I mean, it's still around, I think. Spring Roo, wasn't it called? Yep. You know, but uh, yeah, like most code generator utilities, they sort of eventually kind of seem to fade away, don't they? But... Anyway, I, I think Copilot's a little different than CodeGen, but that's not why we're here tonight. So let's yeah. let's not get off on the chat GPT thing too much. Sorry, but uh, great. Uh, anything else 
that we want to chat about? If not, we can just kind of hang out for a bit. And I think Albina is, uh, uh, will, will let us stay for a few more minutes because mm -hmm. I think we have until at least eight and it is a little bit past eight, but that's okay. <laughs> Albina's awesome like that. So anything else, folks? Okay, let's right. give a round for Sergey. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very warm audience, very welcoming. Uh, it was a pleasure to present to you. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I hope at least some of the stuff I was talking about can be practical for you so that you can apply it, uh, tomorrow and get back to, uh, tonight or something. Um, and you always know where to find us. Uh, you just Google Test Continuous, and uh, we did a good job at CEO. Uh, just a quick one, uh, takeaways, testcontainers.com for all things test containers. Uh, test containers open source, test containers modules, test containers what's not. Test containers cloud is a fun thing to play with so if you have five minutes of your time because it literally takes five minutes of your time to have it up and running, including signing up with account, brew install test containers cloud uh, client and all that. Um, test containers works everywhere. Uh, it's my old slide, by the way, uh, from five years ago where we didn't have test containers cloud. So it says like works on Linux, Mac, and Windows now should add and coffee machines because this thing is, you know, can be, can be controlling coffee machines and wow, you can run your container-based tests uh, on low power devices now too. Um, but what can you really think about is portability of your testing uh, and um, uh, yeah, the great thing, uh, like, the value you're getting without uh, the complexity you need to run, uh, you, you need um, to have to run your test with. And pizza and t-shirts, apparently. So take some pizza yep. with you, okay? And then t-shirts, t-shirts. Mm -hmm. T-shirts here, yep. over here. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank thanks you so everyone. much, all right. And thanks for those who joined online.